Yeah, my name is Yu Xiao, and I'm here at Kent State University as a postdoctoral research associate. And I'm currently sitting in a lab. So uh, what you see in front of me is what the eye tracker looks like and uh, the, the computer here. Uh, I have a camera here uh, showing how the things work, what my hand is doing, where my eyes are and where I'm sitting and what's before me. And in the meantime, I'm going to show my screen later on so that you will know what button I was clicking and how the translog software uh, functions. So um, in today's session, we will be looking at how to collect eye tracking and key logging data uh, using translog. And um, then we will look at how to replay the session in translog for some qualitative analysis. And then uh, we would be uh, further processing the data for more sophisticated uh, statistical analysis in later sessions. So. Um, I hope that my demonstration would be uh, clear to you if you are new to this methodology. Uh, what you can see is that I'm sitting in front of the computer. I have a keyboard, uh, a mouse. Uh, this would be uh, the things that a, an experimental participant would be using. And uh, in front of me, just a screen. And what the screen shows is basically what's open on the computer. Um, and the what's slightly different from a normal computer is that there is an eye tracker mounted at the bottom of the screen here. So um, as uh, when I turn on the eye tracker, you will probably see that there will be light emitting to my eyes. What the eye tracker does is just to emit infrared light to the eyes and then get a reflection and detect two things. One, the position of my pupils. If I move, it'll detect where my pupil uh, uh, where my pupils are, and um, it also detects from the reflected infrared light the rotation of my eyeballs. So if my eyeballs were rotating as indicated by the reflected infrared light uh, to show an angle from the horizontal line, um, from that angle, if we know the distance between the eyes and the eye tracker, then it can calculate. Right. <laughs> if we have the angle here and the distance here, it can calculate the distance here on the screen, right? In the same way, it can calculate the distance on the horizontal and on the vertical. So if we have a reference point on the screen, say the top left corner, then uh, it'll come down to an XY coordinate on the screen associated with a certain point of time. So that's basically what the eye tracker would record, uh, XY coordinates corresponding to each point stamp. What the uh, translog software does is uh, that it, it, it processes the data uh, further and calculates what we call uh, fixations from the gaze points. Um, then um, um, it, it will map the fixations to the words. Um, many, but before it starts, um, um, many uh, of such studies using this kind of methodology um, is based on what we call uh, the I mind hypothesis. Uh, as we're looking into the cognitive processes uh, in translation, uh, uh, they, <laughs> these processes are not directly observable, but we can, however, uh, observe the behavior, right? And eye movement is one of the behaviors. So this type of research is based on what we call the eye-mind hypothesis, which assumes that there is a relationship between the eyes and the mind. So the, um, in other words, the movement of the eyes would be indicative of the uh, cognitive processes uh, in the mind. Uh, in very short terms where the eyes are, where the mind is. So if we observe that the eyes stay on a certain part of the text uh, or show some disruption of, uh, of, of movement uh, in a particular part, then we can reasonably infer that something is happening in the mind uh, associated with that part. Um, uh, when I start the experiment, you could probably see from the camera that the eye tracker it would be emitting infrared, uh, would be emitting some light to my eyes, but in the actual experiment setting, we will not be able to see that. Somehow it's detected by the camera, but uh, in front of me, what I can see is not really what it, um, uh, not that obvious light being projected uh, towards my face. So uh, what I'm going to do is first uh, show you step by step how to collect um, eye movement data using a very simple example, uh, uh, considering myself as an experimental participant. And then uh, I will show you uh, a replay of that session. Uh, and then following that replay, we will upload that data to the server and the server will process the data so that we can download some tables there. Um, um, 
now feel free to interrupt me if something is not clear or if you if there are some technical uh, issues, uh, say in the Internet or uh, anything that um, you will want to point out. So in Translog, um, um, we have two software packages. One is called supervisor and another is user. So if I share my screen, you can see that these two packages are on my desktop. Um, can, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can. Yep. Yes. OK, so um, on my desktop, you can see one is called supervisor and the other is user. We as uh, researchers would be uh, using the supervisor to design our experiments and the user is for the participants to actually conduct uh, their translation or post editing or whatever task it is uh, uh, in the experiments that we have designed. So the first thing I'm going to do is to open supervisor. So if I double click on that, um, it'll give us a dialog which allows us to create a project on the top uh, on the left side of the top menu, we see projects. And if we click create projects here, um, it allows us to configure the experiment. Um, one thing to note to keep in mind is that if you're working, uh, if the language pair that you're working on um, involves Chinese or Japanese, uh, what we want to do is to tick this little box here, uh, which says offline gaze mapping. And this is because for Chinese and Japanese, we have an input method editor, right? That maps the uh, what's hit on the keyboard and what's shown on the display. So if you happen to be a, a speaker of Chinese and Japanese, you would uh, be very much aware that what we type on the keyboard is not actually the characters shown on the screen, right? The letters would have need uh, would need some mapping to the Chinese and Japanese characters. Uh, for that reason, we need offline gaze mapping. For other languages, we don't need that, and and we can just directly proceed to configure experiments. For Chinese and Japanese, tick that box and then configure experiment. So if we click configure experiment, it shows the dialog, um, and this is the interface in which the experimental participants would be working on uh, the language. Um, what we see is that it, it contains two windows. Uh, we would use one window as the source text, the text that's shown to the participant, and the other window would be the uh, the place where the participant would be typing it. Um, um, in this example, let's say that we're doing a translation uh, keyboard. Uh, I don't think we need to specify at this stage, um, but um, I haven't used um, uh, the other type, A, Z, E, R, Y, uh, myself. So uh, we can probably try. And if we see some problems, um, um, you know, uh, that will indicate that there uh, is a need for that. But yeah, thanks for, for the question. So um, suppose we're using the top window for the source text, and I have two sentences here as an example. And suppose we are asking the participants to uh, work on these texts. We can copy the text and then um, paste it in the top window there. Uh, what we see is that if we have line space, line spacing setting in um, our original text, when we paste it here, it'll keep that uh, line spacing here. Um, and what we want to do, if it's an eye tracking experiment, is to enlarge the font so that we would be more likely uh, um, getting more decent eye tracking, a decent quality of eye tracking data. So we want the characters to be uh, slightly larger. And then if we copy the same text into the other window, um, um, oops, probably we can copy it here from here, and then uh, it'll keep that um, line spacing and we can uh, change the font size just to make sure that it's the same as the source. So um, after that, when we delete this line, it'll keep that font size. Uh, and for example, if I type here, it'll be the same size of the font as the source. Uh, we want the participant to type here, so we leave that blank. Now, if it's a post editing, we would put the raw machine translation output here. Uh, there are other functions in this dialog. 
for example, the position of the two windows. So if we click user and translation, uh, we see different options for positioning the target uh, window. Um, for example, if we position the window uh, to the right, we see that the target where the participant will be working uh, it has become uh, in a different position. But for this example, let's just keep it at the bottom and then leave it as it is. Now, you can also change the font, the color, the background color, and so forth. Um, uh, so after all these uh, settings, uh, we can click Save, and it, it will direct us to the original dialogue. So the original dialogue here. Now we have finished configuring the experiment, and since we are connecting it to an eye tracker, we click Plugins, and then tick Eye Sampler here. Um, you know, perhaps uh, it is also important to, to, to note that uh, translog would also work even without an eye tracker. So if you don't have it, for, for those of us who don't really have an eye tracker at hand, uh, don't worry about that. The procedure uh, that I'm showing later on would be exactly the same. The only difference is that we would not have eye tracking data. Translog would still um, record the key strokes. So after these settings, we save our project, I choose where it is saved for this. I choose my desktop and give it a name, say uh, demo. And it will save the file as um, a project file. But there, as you as you see on my desktop, the file is saved as uh, a dot project kind of um, uh, with dot project as an extension. So that's basically it. Um, when this is designed, uh, we can use that the same project for each for all the participants. So if we have 20 participants, we would be able to use the same project for all the participants in our experiment. And, then, and after this, uh, we when the participants come, we would open the user. And there are two ways to open it, either by clicking the user button in the menu bar here, or uh, double clicking on the user software package. Um, so if we click the user here, it opens the dialog. This is ex exactly the same as if we, we double click on the user there. So if we open project by clicking this button, uh, it will show the project that we have just created. And if we open it, we can connect it to an eye tracker, calibrate it, and then um, start the experiment. So the first thing to do is to click modules, eye sampler, and then choose the model of the eye tracker that we're using. In this example, I'm using a Toby eye tracker. So I click here and it starts detecting the eye tracker. Um, so uh, the eye tracker is shown uh, here in the left side uh, on the left side of the dialogue. It's a TX 300, 300 hertz eye tracker. So if we connect to that, we see that it starts detecting where my eyes are. <laughs> Uh, a very interesting image, actually. And uh, you can also see that I'm blinking my eyes. Um, uh, in this dark background, uh, the two little white circles are, uh, two little white <laughs> dots are my left and right eyes. So if I click one on one of my eyes, you can see the one is missing. If I close the other, oops, I close the other, then uh, the uh, another one is missing. Right. Um, what? we need to do is to position the participants correctly. Um, if I move, say, if the chair is too high, right, the eye, uh, the eye data will be lost, right? If it's right too much to the side, it will be lost. And uh, at the bottom, we see a bar which shows a green color. Um, just as an example, if I move away from the eye tracker, we see that the, that the data starts getting lost, right? And the bar becomes red. And if I approach the eye tracker, it'll start becoming orange, where the data is actually very fussy, and then it becomes red. As so I continue approaching the eye tracker uh, and be too close to it, it becomes red again. We don't really want that. So uh, what we want is for the bar to be green. And that indicates that the, the distance between the eyes and the eye tracker would be uh, appropriate. From my previous description of how the eye tracker works, probably you well, are already aware that the distance between the eyes and the eye tracker is pretty important for it to calculate uh, the, the gaze points. Um, uh, one uh, very uh, typical scenario during the experiment is that the participants may move 
<laughs> to, uh, all along, right? They may get tired or they may be trying to figure out what uh, what the, the text on the screen is and they would lean forward or they would move a little bit. Now, what this uh, process does is just to make sure that our participants are positioned correctly. And we want to make sure that they are in a comfortable posture. Uh, in the, on the one hand, their distance from the eye tracker will be correct. And on the other, they would be comfortably reaching the keyboard, the mouse, and then they would be uh, seeing the characters on the screen very clearly. So that's one thing. And another thing that the eye tracker does is to uh, detect. Now, as you see, it's already detecting where my pupils are. And the other aspects, uh, of its detection detection is uh, where I'm looking at, right? And for that, we need a calibration to make sure that the offset for its calculation is correct. Mm -hmm. And if I click here, um, this button called run calibration, it'll run that process. Uh, um, uh, when I click on that, you will see a blank screen and with some dots moving around from four corners and then to the middle of the screen. And we want the participants to follow that dot with their eyes um, um, and let me just show, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, a, 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 a calibration process, maybe a bad calibration. Um, what I want to show here is that um, if the calibration is bad, we would need to uh, recalibrate it, right? And here it doesn't really capture any eye tracking data at all. And sometimes we would have very um, bad results. It captured some of the uh, data. The left side shows the position of my left eye and the appropriate position of that circle indicating where the eyes are supposed to be. Uh, so it has lost two corners and for the right also. And there is one corner where the line is too large, right? We don't really want that. So if we, if we have a bad calibration result, we will want to recalibrate it until it's appropriate. Let me see if I can uh, create a better calibration result so that you know what it looks like. Now, this is slightly better than the previous one, but still we have the long lines. And now let me try to focus and then create, hopefully, satisfactory results. Oops. Now, so you see the lines are much shorter and it captured every spot, right, for both of my eyes. And now if the calibration is correct, now what, what I really want to show is that it's pretty important, right, to make sure that the data is accurate. And if the calibration is completed, uh, we'll click OK and then click Translog Session. So we return to the previous dialog. We recheck the eye sampler and it says that the eye sampler is ready. Uh, at, uh, from this point on, we can start logging. Uh, so uh, once we click start logging, it will show the dialog uh, where the participant, the interface where the participant will be working on their translation task. And let me, uh, let's suppose that I am an experimental participant. And if I start logging, I try to read the source text line by line, and then read the first sentence. And then let me try to type something in the target window, say this method is suited or perhaps when i'm type, typing suited i think ah, perhaps there needs to be another word here and then i continue and while i'm doing it my eyes are um, moving uh, back and forth from the source to the target and then maybe i can rephrase it and then uh, copy uh, the following lines so when i see two or more i uh, my eyes stay on it for some time and then maybe rephrase it as more than one observations for each unit of observation. The unit of observation. So if I continue copying the exact wording of the source text, a store a customer as city. Etc. And then when the participant is finished, we click stop logging at the top left and save the log file uh, in 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 an XML format. So say uh, if I name it as P01, meaning participant number one underscore 
T1, meaning its translation and the text is number one. Then uh, if we save it on a desktop, that's done. That's basically how we collect data from the translog. And we see that the file is saved as an XML file here on the desktop. Very simple and very straightforward. Um, when the next participant comes, we can repeat this process, open the project, and calibrate the eye tracker, and then start the experiments, perhaps save it as P2, P02T1, right? Indicating it's participant number two for exactly the same task and the same test. Um, after that log, um, we can replay the session in Translog Supervisor. We've looked at the first button, which is project, and the second, which is user, and now we're moving on to the third, uh, which is replay. So if we open that log file in replay, then we see the same interface in the experiment, and we can play that as it is a video. Um, here for the play button, we would see how the eyes move and how uh, the the typing proceeds. Now, if I pause it somewhere. Sorry, Yusheng, just to yeah. interrupt you. Very, very yeah. nice. Thank you so much. But just a correction, it's not a video, it's a replay of actually the data. It's yes. not a recording as a video. Yes. Uh, that's yeah, a small it, detail, but maybe uh, it's an important difference. Thank you. Yeah, 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 right. You're, 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 you're right. So this is a, just an XML file, and in the translog interface, it can replay the, the process of the session, right? Uh, uh, it looks as if it's a video, but in fact, it's just an XML file. Uh, file. So uh, uh, what I tried to say was that uh, we can have these button of play and pause, uh, you know, in the same way as we play a video here. But yeah, the file itself is not a video. So if we pause somewhere, we can see that um, there is there are a lot of green dots and red dots and a blue circle and a highlight on the word. What it basically means is that the green dots um, indicate where my left eye is, and you know, the green and red indicates where my eyes are. Uh, they, those are the gaze points uh, from the eye track, from the raw data uh, uh, collected by the eye tracker. And the uh, the, the blue circle uh, is the calculated fixations. Uh, it means that the, at this point, at this point of time, the eyes are fixating this area, and the translog software would map this area uh, onto the word that's actually fixated. So um, the word suited would be highlighted. Now, if I continue playing, you can, you can see the highlight there. So what, I'm what I was doing was to look at the suited and, and then change the uh, inserted a word there, and then the eyes uh, switch, keep switching back and forth between the two windows. And then as the typing proceeds, my eyes would read forward and then come to the target and then type the words. Right. Sometimes it, 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 it moves backward. Sometimes it stays on the words for an extended uh, period of time. Now, um, there are other functions in the software. Uh, we can change the speed of the play in terms of percentage. And we can uh, indicate the start time in milliseconds. And there are other functions here. Uh, probably when, when you practice using the software, you would uh, uh, be aware uh, and 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 be familiar with what these functions are. Um, so as I said, uh, this uh, type of study is uh, usually based on the I mind hypothesis. So from there, uh, if we observe some uh, typical behavior in the eye movement, we can infer uh, what might be happening in the cognitive processes in the mind. Uh, that are manifested by this eye movement behavior. And in the meantime, we can also look at how the eyes coordinate with the hands because the typing and the uh, and the eye movement would be shown and synchronized in one single uh, session. So that's basically what the Translog software does um, with uh, data collection and then a replay of the of the uh, of the process of the experiment. Um, for, for more sophisticated statistics, we would need further processing, and there are two ways of doing it. One, just, hold on, just, just hold on. Let, yeah. let's, let's ask uh, people whether uh, they have questions or uh, 
comments or something? Yes. So, for instance, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you speak up, maybe you can you can you understand if she speaks here. Can you understand that? You Shane? Yes. Yes, Michael. Uh, can you say it again? OK, she comes. Uh, she comes to the front to uh, speak the question. Um, wouldn't it be important for the participant to be a fixed distance from the eye tracker at all time? How do you um, do that with this kind of setup without a chin rest or headrest or something like this? Um, I think uh, what, what the calibration did, as I as I showed in the beginning of the configuration, um, it shows a green bar, right? We want. Uh, I think the, what we want to do is to make the participant feel where uh, is is appropriate, and it actually had a large range of distance, so we don't really need to tell them to remain in one position and stay there, not leaning forward a little bit. They can actually lean forward a bit, but not really too far away, right, from where, where they are. And I think the point there is to position them in a comfortable posture that they can uh, probably maintain uh, in their task. So they need to be comfortably reaching the keyboard and reading the characters on the screen very uh, clearly so that they, they would know, you know where they are. Uh, if we put the chair and set up the eye tracker correctly, I think uh, most of the time it should be OK. Uh, yeah, in very short time. I'm not sure if I'm uh, answering that question uh, appropriately, but um, uh, in very short terms, we, we do. We, we don't really need them to yeah, remain here and not moving at all in, in, in the experiment. Okay, so do they do they see this green red bar throughout the whole experiment or just the, during the calibration? Sorry, can you? Can you yeah, can you uh, so I, I, the, I saw the red and green bars earlier, but do they see that only during the calibration or do they see it while they're also doing the eye tracking experiment? Only during, only during the calibration, before the calibration. Okay, so yes. then I guess maybe it's up to the examiner to ensure that they, you know, stay reasonably in that distance. Right, that's that's what, uh, I mean, I, I guess that's what one should tell those uh, participants know that they shouldn't move too much and stay uh, a little bit in the same position so they can move a little bit as you Yu Sheng said but not too much okay and um, and for instance one advice also is then to give them chairs with no rolls so that they wouldn't move away with their chairs and so on right. you know if you have steady chairs then it's more difficult to move mm -hmm. and uh, that would be one uh, suggestion or maybe also with, you know, not like a, with a back that moves and stuff like this. So make sure the environment is such that they're not invited to move too much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Are there other questions? There was a question in the um, chat, which I think is interesting about the space constraint on the window. In other words, is it is it possible for them to scroll through a longer text, or is there a limit? Is there okay, a space so, constraint? Yeah. Uh, so, so the space uh, now with respect to the length of the text, or the space uh, in, with respect to the distance uh, from the screen. So the question is on on the chat. I think the person is asking about space constraint in the translog window. So number of number of characters. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, sorry, uh, my question. I mean, um, you know, there is an upper window and a lower window. And so, I mean, if there is a space constraint on the upper window, how many words do you suggest should I put uh, on the upper window, like uh, 200 or 300 words? Yeah, sh should I answer this? Uh, so, yeah, so if our um, text usually had something like between 100 and 150 words, English words, which uh, are not so long. So this is, uh, what is this, 600 characters perhaps. And uh, so the idea would be uh, to have a, as big font as possible. And uh, and then uh, if your texts are smaller, then you can have the bigger font and also have a double space uh, distance. Uh, so what 
Um, so in, in fact, uh, our, our, you can also have translog scrolling. So if you the text is much longer, the window starts scrolling, but this is not supported with the eye tracker. So if so it, it would record the keystrokes and so on in a scrolling window, but if you have an eye tracker, then um, it's not implemented how um, the uh, it does not work with scrolling. So um, uh, if my test is too long, uh, can I uh, make it into three translog files? Then... Yes, that would be a remedy. OK, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, what does the purple square mean in the replay? Sorry, I haven't uh, heard very clearly the explanation of the purple square. Just now there are a, a, green, a green dots and red dots and a blue circles. Can you take this, Yu Sheng? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so if we replay the session, I think you're asking, oops, <laughs> let me pause it somewhere where the image is clear, right? You see the yeah. green and the red. Yes. Those are, yeah, those are the gaze points. Those are from the eye tracker. And uh, the translog software will calculate from these eye positions a, an area, right, which is indicated by the blue circle. And that's what we call a fixation. This fixation is then mapped onto the characters, the words that are shown on the screen. And the highlight, I think you're asking about this highlight, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, this highlight, okay. this mm -hmm. highlight indicates which word is mapped from the fixation. Right. So the eye tracker tells us where the eyes are and Translog has information about uh, which word is in that position and it maps this fixation onto that word. So the highlight means that at this time, at this timestamp, the eyes are looking at this word. Okay. So you can also, so you can also for, uh, for instance, show in the top left corner, there's a, a drop down menu plot and you can uh, extend this and then you can show what is this there it's very small it's uh so the fixations and the gaze to word mapping so you can actually select there what you want to see in the replay mode whether you want to see this um, gaze points which would be the green and the red dots whether you want to see the yes and here you only see the the mappings actually not the other data right yeah over here right we can only see that but we can we can we can show the word only, right? So where which words the the eyes are looking at, right? Or we can change what, um, say, the, only the gaze, right? These are the gaze points. And because uh, this was recorded with the Toby three hundred, so there are, it means there are three hundred points per second. Right, so it has a frequency of 300 hertz. This to be 300. It means uh, each eye, the left and the right eye, are recorded, sampled 300 times per second. So it means that the green and the red dots there are 300 per second. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's a big overhead, so you can just uh, not show it on that screen. Yeah. Can I ask a more general question? Yes. Then one more question here. If someone translates the text. Can you hear that, uh, Yusheng? Uh, not really. Okay, Can so you... I'll try to speak up or I should. Hello? Yeah, it's coming, yeah. that person. Okay. okay. It's a more of a general question. I. Because it's the first time I'm hearing about this area of uh, research and uh, I'm quite uh, surprised. My question is like, I'm thinking if someone translates the text, right, and he or she stumbles upon a word that doesn't remember, uh, at that point, I would say it's reasonable that this person might wander off. His gaze will go all over the place because he's mm -hmm. not really interested in the text. He's just trying to recall the word. So this noise, how can we filter it out? How can we detect that is a noise in the first place? Because uh, I know that the night tracking movements going back uh, or forward is uh, is not an artifact. It's not always an artifact. So how can we detect this kind of noise from actual movements that are meaningful? Well, that's a very good question. 
and very troublesome. <laughs> but, but yeah, so uh, it has to do with the um, pause, uh, the pause. No, so if that person reads, then that wouldn't type, and we would call that uh, in some of these analysis, it would be called a pause, a typing pause. Mm -hmm. And if there are longer pauses, it re I mean, it's an indicator of exactly what you're saying, you know, that the person may be thinking of stuff, what is um, how to render this and so on. And um, yeah, and we can, then one can look into if the, if the recordings, the gaze data recordings is precise, you can see how the eyes wander. Mm -hmm. And um, so this contradicts a little bit this I mind yeah. hypothesis, right? Yes. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge to figure out to what extent this I mind hypothesis needs to be taken literally mm -hmm. or uh, it's just a, you know, a rough approximation of what could be the case. In a sense, it also, this wandering also signifies uh, like mind activity. You're trying to recall something. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, like contradictory to the, to the general idea, just a different uh, you know, aspect of it, yeah. I guess. But I guess we will look into those kinds of related questions a little bit later when we analyze the data. And I think uh, this will pop up again. Thank you. Or uh, any other addition, Yushin? Uh, no, I think uh, you, you've just uh, answered everything to that. Uh, yeah, it, it is about the I mind hypothesis and how we can relate the observable behavior to something that's in the, this black box. Right? Um, uh, it may not strictly correspond. And I think um, uh, the only thing we can do is to um, um, infer what might be happening right, uh, from the eye movement. Um, Maybe the I mind hypothesis should be uh, loosened a little bit, or maybe uh, we just, um, um, you know, from this kind of experiment, uh, see what is directly observable and see what's manifested uh, by this cognitive processes that are not observable. Um, um, and if we see the same kind of behavioral patterns for a, uh, across different individuals, across different languages and experiments, uh, then perhaps we can reasonably say that uh, if this person is trying to recall something, then uh, a, a certain kind of eye movement might appear. And for that, um, I think the, the Creek database as a large database would be uh, very convenient. Uh, it will provide a convenient ground for us to do that. And in the meantime, I think eye movement data uh, is just a method, right? The eye, the eye, eye tracking method. And we can also triangulate that with other kinds of uh, methods like retrospective, uh, think aloud, and ask the participant, hey, you showed this eye movement, and what were you doing in this part of the text? And if they say that, uh, okay, I'm trying to recall this word, and as uh, a, a researcher, if we observe that when people try to recall a certain word, uh, a certain kind of eye movement pattern tends to occur, then perhaps we can relate that eye movement to this process. That's uh, what popped into my mind. So. I'm not really sure. Does that make sense? Yep, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so a practical question. Which of the three versions should we download? Um, I would say that the three versions, it, it depends on what eye tracker we're using, right, Michael? Yeah, so the most recent is, the, of course, the most updated one. And um, I think the most recent one, uh, Toby has uh, a couple of years ago changed their strategy of how they link uh, the eye trackers with a different API and so on. So the more recent one is more compatible with the uh, more recent Toby eye trackers. Yeah. Um, so there's another question in the chat. Um, uh, does the offline Sorry, does the offline gaze mapping box need to be used for only Chinese and Japanese or for other non-Latin scripts too? For example, Arabic, Russian, or Korean. Uh, I think for the moment it's just Chinese or Japanese, but I'm not really sure about Korean. Perhaps Michael has a better answer for that. Well, that's that's um, should be used when uh, you use an IME, an input method 
uh, what is it called? IME editor, no? For, for Korean, you have the, you don't have this, no? You write directly Hangul, uh, what is the name? Yeah. yeah, so you correct immediately write this, right? So we have a Korean person here in the classroom and she says for Korean, we don't need this. Uh, they type in over the keyboard. I think for Hindi, uh, we also have Hindi speakers here, right? Uh, or writers, and I think they have also IMEs uh, sometimes, do they? Means an IME, for those who don't know, um, for, uh, for Chinese, for instance, because uh, Chinese has so many different characters and the keyboard is too small. I mean, they cannot all be represented. So they are somehow composed. And uh, so you in Chinese, there are several ways to do this often. Uh, you write phonetically and then there's a little kind of a program that uh, converts this phonetic ping, pinging that people are writing, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, trans, uh, transforms this into the Chinese character and once the then the writer um, can confirm this conversion and only then it appears in the editor. And so this whole process before, so from the keyboard until it appears in the editor is handled by an additional input method. And this input method is opaque. It, I mean, an external program has not access to that part of uh, the process. So we cannot actually know which characters are typed. And if we wanted to figure this out, then this gaze mapping interferes with this IME and makes this mapping impossible or interferes. And so we cannot do this at runtime. This So what happens here in Translog, if you type in the legend characters as Yu Sheng did, we can have a real time at real time at runtime while he is typing, the gaze data is collected, the fixations are computed and the mapping takes place. Right, so while at, at runtime, and all this cannot be done when the IME uh, is in place, and that's why you should then tick this box, uh, do offline mapping. So then first the gaze is recorded, and then in the second uh, mapping step, uh, uh, this mapping would happen. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so. Uh, for the Latin characters, right? It, it, it's directly you know, what we type on the keyboard is directly what's shown on the screen. But with Chinese, we would have an indirect way of putting the character on the screen, uh, right? The input med editor might be, say, Sogo, right? Or the so uh, Microsoft input editor. So that's why we need offline mapping. But that kind of language, uh, after uh, collecting the data, we need to replay the session. Uh, and that's where the fixation towards mapping takes place. Um, yeah, so to answer that question, um, it is only when uh, we use an input method editor, and whenever we use an input me uh, method editor, we would need this offline case mapping. Yeah. Um, the next one sounds like data manipulation. Oh yeah, I think that you're referring to the fixation of the case towards mapping, right? Um, Someone asked, uh, Lee Ku asked, um, during the experiment, some participants came up with trouble in calibration. We tried three or four times, but there are always unacceptable calibration results in one or two points. Do you have any suggestion uh, on this issue? Um, well, it depends on why, right? I, don't, I can't really say the reason behind that, but sometimes well, it depends on a lot of uh, you know, many factors there the lighting conditions, the setup of the experiment. And, and, and my personal experience is that some of the participants have very thick glasses and, and sometimes the, the eye tracking data would be um, uh, not as good as someone who uh, is better sighted. But uh, yeah, I, I can't really say for sure what the reason behind that is. Um, um, okay, okay, Yushin, can you... Still try to upload this data to the database so that we can see how that works. Yes, of course. So uh, 
Yeah, but one word. There's uh, who who ping ping right asked uh, how can we remove the outlier? I think we will cover that in the data analysis in future sessions, right? Just so you know, um, it's not something we do in trials, but it's something we do in uh, data analysis. Now, um, in Translog, we have already collected the data uh, in the format of XML. But if we take a closer look at what it contains, we can open that XML with a text editor. You can use Notepad to open it. And we see that it contains a lot of information about the experimental uh, session itself, where the file is saved, and how the windows were managed, the source text and the target text. And then if we scroll down, we see in the events section all the fixations and the eye movement data. If you're interested, you can look into the details. But now, for the moment, the only thing we need to do in order to upload this data for the server to uh, for further processing is just to copy one line here into the X XML. Um, um, just so you know, this web page was uh, is on the link that I have just sent in the chat box um, in the Crete at Kent website. If you go to Crete TPRTB and click uploading, it will show this web page and it contains step by step procedures for doing it. Uh, there are two ways. One, by uploading it to the server and let the server automatically process your data so that you can download the tables uh, directly, or you can also run some scripts on your computer and then get the, uh, the, the, the data uh, locally. But it's, it pr it's probably more convenient to upload it to the server, and that's what we're doing uh, here today. So if we copy this line here to the XML file before plugins. Now, so if we copy that, uh, paste that here, it indicates the source language being English here, the target language. If we say that the target language is also English and that the task is translating, which really doesn't really make sense because I'm translating from English to English, but as a demonstration, purpose, uh, let's just keep it that way. So what this line does is to indicate the source and target languages and the task. With that, we save the XML and then close it. And with there, from there, we can upload it to the server. The link to the server is also shown on this web page, um, which is called Yawat. It's basically an alignment tool. So if we click on that link, you will be directed to a login interface. I've already logged in, so we directly uh, come here. But for the first, if you log in for the first time, it'll ask for the username and the password. The username is summer 2023, uppercase, and the password is summer 2023 in lowercase, as uh, what we have learned uh, in our yesterday's session. I have already uploaded some data here, so this is what it looks like. But to go through the procedure, let me do it again. Uh, if we click TPD here, it directs us to the interface where we can upload. And here we see a choose file button on the top left. Um, the file that we choose is this one. But if you have a set of experiments, um, uh, we would upload all of them in one go, not really one by one. So we zip the folder and with one single experimental session, we would still need to zip it. So what I'm going to do here is to add it to a zip file, which is here, and then upload this zipped file to the server. Um, select it and then designate a study name. For example, if I use my own name as the study name, um, Yu Xiang Wei, source language, English. So here, yeah. Actually, Yu Xiang, here, yeah. this, if you click the source and the target language there, yeah. then it's the same as if you would insert this, uh, this, uh, uh, the, this line. So ah, it okay. actually does this for, so you can do, of course, you can do both. <laughs> But uh, if you if you use the source and the target language and the task name there, then you wouldn't need to paste this in manually. Ah, okay, okay. So this is a new interface. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually more convenient, right? Yes. So with this, is, yes. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. So uh, just so you know, um, we have. I have inserted this line here, um, but in the new interface in the crit server, we have options here so that for those of us who are not familiar with this kind of. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, this kind of uh, uh, language, um, we can also work on a graphical interface here. So it's exactly the same as what I did in the XML file. As name here, right? Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that at the moment we need to insert a dash uh, a hyphen C lowercase in the other task name just to indicate that this um, is the uh, old tokenizer simply because there is an issue with our current tokenizer. But if we insert that, we would use the previous tokenizer. If we upload the file, what the server does is to tokenize the text segment the sentences and align the sentences between the source and the target. But it does not align at the token level. So after this, we will need to align at the token level. But let me just show what happens when we click upload. Now that's completed. And now we see the study with my name here. Right, that's the study that I've uploaded. And then from there, we can um, open Yawat. Here we can uh, click on open Yawat, and then we would be able to see our experimental session. Participant number one, uh, uh, task translation on the first text. And this is the current time uh, when I uploaded the data. If we click on that, uh, we will come to the Yawat um, uh, word level alignment interface. What we want to do is to align this word by word. So if we click one word in the source text, one word in the target text, it will be highlighted. And after this, if we click, if we right click on them, then it, it aligns these two. So if I move my pointer from to one word in the source, then the corresponding word in the target would also be highlighted. So if I do this uh, for all of the words, then uh, they will be fully aligned. And other than word by word, we can also have one, two, multiple tokens alignment, because that's what, what was perhaps more common in uh, translation, right? You would, we would have one word in the source that corresponds to multiple words in the target, and we can also do that. Just select all of them and then right click on all of them so that you see when I move the, the, the pointer to one word, then uh, two words in the target would be highlighted. So if I continue this and in which corresponding to when and word by word, two or more corresponding to more than one. So it can be, it can also be multiple word to multiple words, right? Excuse me, Yuxian. Yeah, yeah. Could could you explain exactly what you're doing? Because that went a little fast. So you're clicking on a word in the source text. Yes. And then clicking on a word in the target text and then right clicking to accept the alignment. Right, right, exactly. So if I want to align, for example, um, observation here, uh, can you see my pointer clearly? Yes. Yes. So if I want to align this word in the source to that word in the target, I click on the source, click on the target with my left uh, button on the mouse, and then right click, then it'll confirm this alignment. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, Great. Thanks. Yes. So after we complete one se a sentence, remember to tick this box indicating it's done. Maybe I should make it larger here, right? Indicating it's done. Now, it is only after we click this that the alignment would be saved on the server. Otherwise, the next time we open it, uh, we don't want the, the alignment to be lost. So, same thing for the second. Now, I'm showing completely manual labor for this process. There is a script in the server that does this automatically, but um, maybe I can align these all together. But um, um, some somehow after the manual after the automatic alignment, uh, we may still need some manual checking. But um, as for illustration purposes, let me just show how it can be done manually. This alignment is required simply because in the data tables, we have the segmentation of the behavioral data in different ways in terms of the source text or the target text, and that's based on the alignment. So. When we finish all these alignments and take all the boxes, we can return to the index here on top. 
and to make sure that our alignment is saved, let's open it again and see if. Oops, the second one. Now, but let's leave it behind. But maybe I, I, I forgot to take this. But uh, when the first one is saved, so um, if we return to the uh, uh, the index, um, we would see the the experimental session that we have just uploaded. And if we have uploaded multiple sessions, then all of them would be shown here. Uh, then to process this and to generate uh, tables, um, we go to TPD again, and then um, there would be a button. Uh, Click for save alignments. Yes, <laughs> save alignments. Yes, remember to save it. <laughs> um, and then after the alignment is saved, um, we would uh, be able to make tables, right? If we click make tables, then it shows download tables here, right? And for uh, for that button, it'll directly download all the tables here. And if we open the downloaded file, maybe I should delete the previous one. This is the file that was downloaded from the server. And if we extract it, extract all the tables here, then we see a lot of files, right? With different extensions. Uh, one of them is .st extension. Well, what these tables do, uh, they all come from our translog uh, file. Um, these separates the data in different ways. The .st, the .st file um, separates the uh, uh, the data in terms of the source text. So again, if I open it with a text editor, I remember not to double click on it, but to open it in a text editor. We see that the data had a lot of lines, a lot of rows, and a lot of columns. There are columns indicating the study, the session, the language, and so forth. But what's um, unique about the ST table is that uh, it arranges all these lines in terms of the source text. So the first line is the first word in the source text, second line is the second word in the source text, and so forth. And for each source word text, we have different kinds of data, like uh, is there a pause? Is there a deletion? Uh, is there an insertion? And uh, what the probability of this word is? What is its translation uh, as we indicated in the alignment? Was it part of speech, right? Uh, um, um, and, and, and the eye movement data as well. How much time uh, do the eyes stay on this word and so forth? Um, in our later sessions, we will be using this kind of data but uh, just a, a brief illustration of what it looks like. Now that's the ST table. There's also a TT table, which arranges the data in terms of the target text. So each line is a target word, starting from the beginning until the end, and, uh, and all the columns in, the, uh, in a row shows the corresponding, say, eye tracking and key logging data associated with the particular, uh, the, the target language word in question. So. Um, that's the SD and TT. There are also other kinds of tables. Um, AU, yeah, FU, and yeah, we'll come into the details later on. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's how we process the data. Okay, that... so maybe you can yeah, maybe you can show um, how to upload this uh, also with the uh, with the uh, with the sim align feature. Then we have this alignment, and then the, uh, does this work um, for you the uh, shiny server? You can show this data on the shiny server directly. You mean the progression graph or? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, somehow I was trying to do it, but somehow the computer in the lab doesn't really open that web page. I yeah, think it mine might... too. It doesn't work anymore. I don't. Yeah. Don't yeah. understand why. Yeah, it opens on my laptop though. Um, yeah. I think it's probably better if we look at the progression graph, right? That's more intuitive. Uh, but just so uh, our participants will know, in the Crete web page, um, there is a session under Crete TPRDB here called Public Studies, right? So if we go to Public Studies, we come to this page and uh, it shows how we can visualize our translation uh, in terms of a, a progression graph. Uh, I have shown a, one way of visualizing it using the replay uh, mode in Translog, but perhaps in a more useful way uh, in terms of our analysis would be in progression graph. And here, if we click on a picture or that link, 
it opens a web page where uh, it allows us to generate this progression graph. But somehow this computer doesn't really connect to that. Um, maybe we can just as a brief, just um, a rough idea of what, what it looks like. Now the graph shows the process, right? Um, in as, oops, of the eye movement and the 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 key strokes. Uh, maybe maybe you can yeah. you still uh, can you upload the same data with the SI option, for instance? If you upload the data that you have created to um, that server, and you tick. Um, uh, you go back to TPD there, and you upload the same data that you uh, that you created. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, yes, you call this somehow number two. Yeah. Or something. Uh, if you like, you can give the source and the target language, but that doesn't matter because it's now already there, right? Yeah. Exactly. So you put this, and then. Um, you write in there minus small c and then sa in uppercase. And so this is an option where you have this automatic alignment, right? A word alignment. If you now click on upload, so it gives you a plot of what happens there and it first uh, extracts the data from uh, this uh, zip file, then it tokenizes, and what it says in the end, it does the sim, uh, sim align, which is an automatic alignment, a word alignment tool. Now, if you go into this uh, underscore SA session there, and the Yavat, uh, go to open Yavat, yes, this one, and you look into this, it should all be automatically aligned. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you can see and save a little bit of energy by uh, having sim align aligning yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So what I showed a moment ago was completely manual work in aligning these words, right? At the, <laughs> aligning the, the language at the token level. So um, um, when I uploaded it, um, I indicated Right, the source, the target, the task, and then the in the other task name, it was only uh, hyphen lowercase c, right, for the first time. But if we type dash uh, hyphen c and then uh, capital letters s a and click upload, it will generate this um, similar line s a study. And in that study, uh, when we open uh, the uh, alignment interface, we see that these some most of the words are automatically aligned, right? But this is an automatic uh, alignment tool called sim align here. Um, still, we see that some of the words were not aligned, right? Because the the automatic they didn't alignment. Know how to, they didn't know how to align customer with kutumar. <laughs> kutumar. Yeah, right. right. So it's, it's it's not very uh, typo resistant now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that saves us a lot of effort, right? So, with the so yeah, so you could yeah. now actually post it at this and uh, align this customer with the Kutuma if you like, if you wanted to, or the other words, and then uh, and, and then kind of post it these alignments. Yeah, which if which there one? is a word that's not aligned, we can uh, do the exactly the same thing as I showed. We click on a source, click on a target, and then right click, and then they become aligned. If there's a mistake, for example, um, when I want to align when uh, to in which rather than only which, then I click on the source, the target, and then uh, the additional word in the target, and then right click on it so that it can be changed. Or if this more, uh, if this uh, than one should be aligned together, then I can just select them and then confirm, then this alignment will be changed. So that's the way we edit the alignment. And click on done, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then click done. So that 
this alarm sentence is saved, then um, yeah. Yes, okay. and then go back to TPD, and then you still need to click there again on save alignments. Yes. There too. Yes, there. So when we finish all the alignments, uh, we need also to click the save Yawat alignment here. And then we can make tables. Yeah. Yes. Um, th does anyone try to look into this uh, shiny server? And has everybody the same problems? Because I have the same problems. If you go back to that um, crit website there and you click on that shiny server on that progression graph uh, um, link there, it doesn't open for me either. And for some people it did, and for me it does not. I don't know why this is the case. Do you have the same problem, any, everybody? Or do you manage to show this, to, to see that? If you, do you try this? Somebody tries this? No? What should we click on? Well, if you click just, if you go to that web page there that Yusheng shows, and you click on that uh, picture there, then it should open a web page where you can, uh, where you should be able to see exactly or a similar picture. It works for Sarah. Okay. So, Sarah, do you mind to share your screen maybe for the for the uh, last seven minutes? and show uh, what you can see there. Is, is Sarah the only one uh, for whom that works? You think you said on your Mac it also works, no? That's very strange. Yeah, yeah. Okay, see here, that's, that's the thing. So if you scroll down, can you scroll down? Okay, you see user there, okay? Can you replace this user TPRDB with the user that we are? We are the user summer 2023 in uppercase, no? Is that uppercase? I cannot see, it's too small. Yes, okay, now you scroll up again and you go to input log. Okay, you get, go to that study that you should just, you go to that and you go to that exactly click there. If you click there, and you go to that Yusheng SA to the last one, to that session. Yes, click there. And now you click on load selected session. Now you can see the two sentences that Yusheng produced. And you can see on the left side, maybe Yusheng, you can explain. Uh, yeah, um, so if we zoom in, and um, in, in this interface, we see two options for x axis and y axis right if you look at the left side of that web page yeah and those options allows us to zoom in so yes if we uh drag that yeah then it allows us to zoom in and this uh shows uh perhaps a bit oh i'm not sure where we are <laughs> uh, maybe we can zoom in Oops, it's not really showing. Um, if it's not showing, we can load the, the selected session again. So if we click load session. What happened? Oops. <laughs> Maybe something is happening on the server. Can, can we try it again? Can we click on load session? Oops. Um, <laughs> so it's not really showing. Um, or maybe we can try the the other session, the one that. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, just this session should be okay. That's a, yeah. So uh, on the horizontal axis, we see different timestamps, right? The horizontal axis in this progression graph indicates time in milliseconds. The numbers there. So for the first one, we see five thousand, right? On the horizontal axis, and that means it's five seconds uh, from the start of the experiment. And the, the first one that's um, um, 
Sarah has um, has moved uh, is just to zoom in along the horizontal, and the second line zooms in on the other axis. The horizontal axis, as I said, indicates time, and the vertical axis indicates the tokens, the words in the source text. So if we read the, the, the words on the left side, it's actually the source text word by word. Now, if we don't zoom in, sometimes it does not really show all the words there, but once we zoom in, it'll start showing um, word by word uh, kind of Y axis. And on the right hand side is the target text word uh, as aligned in the uh, in our Yawad interface. And the order in which it is shown on the right hand side is just the order of the source text. That's basically it. Um, in the progression graph in the middle, we see green, what's that, diamonds uh, and blue dots. And we can also see some black characters and red characters. Um, the blue dots there indicate fixations in the source text window. The green diamonds indicate fixations in the target text. And the characters are simply the keystrokes. So if we zoom in to, uh, what was that? Um, say 10,000 in the horizontal, in the X axis, if we go to what, uh, yeah, 10,000 um, and, and then perhaps zoom in, uh, drag the other uh, uh, circle, no, in, in the X axis. So if we say from 15,000 to, um, um, yeah, 30 something, yeah, over there. Yeah, uh, maybe we can just have a larger range, right? Uh, from 1,000 to 30,000, for example. Yes, yes. Um, now, what this graph shows is that the, um, as I said, the blue dots indicate the fixations on the source and the green diamonds were on the target. Uh, this is what's happening between this, uh, in this time range when I was typing the uh, the text. And if we zoom in in the Y axis, uh, if we drag the, uh, the yes, um, the one to 20, for example, yes, then we get a clearer picture of what's happening, right? Um, at, at the start in 100 and what's that, 10,500 milliseconds, I started typing this while looking at this as indicated by the green diamonds there, right? The green diamonds indicate fixations on the target. And if this fixation is on um, the word this, then it means that I'm looking at what I'm typing. And after that, I, my eyes move to the source as indicated in the, um, what's the time there, right? Right, the next fixation shown in blue dots. And that corresponds in the Y axis to method, meaning that I'm looking at the word method before starting typing again. And then after that fixation, I started typing method um, while my eyes stay on the word uh, method and then moves on to the next word, which is is. And then I started typing I, right? Um, so this shows how this uh, process unfolds. And just to sum up, all these black characters uh, mean insertions from the keyboard. The blue dots are fixation on the source and the, uh, the, the green diamonds are on the target. And sometimes we can also see from the progression graph uh, uh, reading ahead or uh, regressions or um, some uh, indication of hesitation during the process. Um, if we go to the later part uh, in time, we would also see the uh, red characters meaning uh, deletions. So, um, yeah, 